All right, let's do it. Martin, take it away. After 100 years in service, the Panama Canal still is one of the most important and impressive engineering achievements in modern times. Built in 1914, it held a prominent role in the deployment of military vessels during World War I and in the conflicts that have followed. Nowadays, commercial usage is the core business of the channel. Its economic impact is profound and not only developed the region, but in fact helped define shipping throughout the world. In the wake of the canal's opening, hull designs were influenced accordingly. Ships fell into three categories, those that could travel easily through and in groups, the feeder class, massive ocean-going ships too big to enter the canal, ULCV or ultra-large container vessels, and the new standard, designed to the maximum limits of the Panama Canal. These are called the Panamax ships. Which, ironically, are kind of, that's kind of outdated now because there's been an expansion to the Panama Canal that now allows we're in the post-Panamax era, mm -hmm. if you will. But that's not about the game, so let's just move on. So in Panamax, players are going to be attempting to build up their personal wealth by using their shipping companies to load cargo onto theirs and other ships, transporting that cargo through the Panama Canal and completing contracts to invest in shares of the companies to build up their personal portfolios of cash and company stock. At the end of three rounds, whoever has the most personal wealth is the winner. So there's a lot to take in. If you are new to Panamax, this is going to be a pretty involved teach, but the rule book is not the easiest to learn from, so I'm hoping that this helps ease it a little bit for all of y'all out there that are unfamiliar. If you are familiar, well, we'll see y'all in about 40 minutes. So what are y'all looking at here? So in the main board, there's, like I said, a lot of information, but it's all clear and it makes a ton of sense once you know what you're looking at. So the first thing we're gonna talk about here is the action table. There are dice valued one to six pips. And in the, in the regular game, all of these are white dice. We have uh, modified our copy with four blue dice for the executive actions. I'll obviously talk about that later on. These allow for actions to be taken by the players, and there are three contracts that are available out here, as you can see there. There is the draw space and the inbound cargo contracts as well here. Then we have the stock market table, and that shows the value of a given company's shares and the dividends that they may pay at the end of a round. Up above that, we have the rail table, which is going to dictate turn order, which turn order is shown right there in the color of the discs, as Martin is showing y'all. We have the round markers, which are the brown discs over there. Then we have the bonus cards down here in the bottom right. We have financial advisors, stevedore cards, which I just love saying the word stevedore, and captain cards next to those. Then we have the dice pool, down here, which then feeds into the warehouse. These are the where the player's dice will live, and these represent cargo. So every player starts with nine dice. You'll notice that yellow, for instance, has four here, four here, and then everybody starts with one die out on one of their ships, out traversing the, or transversing, traver going through the Panama Canal, <laughs> all right? Then there's the main waterway showing the Panama Canal itself. There are two directions. Technically, the directions are north and south. However, for the because of the way the board is laid out, I'm going to reference either east and west or left and right more likely, okay? So there are two waiting zones, which are the light blue zones on each side of the board. There's one over here and there's one over there. Then uh, connected to that are the two loading zones. And the two loading zones, two being here, to being over there. You're gonna notice that those have a line between them. They are divided for the company flags, meaning this is where, when you have contracts for a certain country, that those country flags will be represented there. So we have China, we have the US West, then over here we have the EU, and we have the US East, all right? We're going to have a mix of player-owned ships as well as neutral ships owned by the four countries in the game as well as just neutrals. So you'll notice that there are there's one Chinese military ship, one U.S. West military ship. There is a neutral cruise ship, another neutral cruise ship, 
another military here and there, a neutral cruise ship, and then the San Juan uh, Prospector, which is uh, a Panamax ship. We'll talk about all those as we go along. As ships leave the loading zones, they'll follow the arrows passing through locks and lakes until they've made it through the entire canal, which represent having delivered the goods. So you'll notice that these loading zones, there is an arrow right here. We're going to go through this series of locks into this lake, and then into this lock, into this lock, and then finally into Lake Gatun down here, staying on this side of the lake, anywhere out here, and then passing through these three series of locks, and then finally abstractly delivering their cargo out to the various countries. But what does that mean for us gameplay-wise? They're going to come out, once they deliver here, they're going to get some sort of reward or bonus, then they're going to go up into the uh, waiting area there. Whereas this side does the exact same, but here, coming through this series of locks into Lake Gatun, up through that lock, up through that lock, into the lake, there and then abstractly delivering their goods coming down into the waiting zone here. All right, lastly, there is a movement track table to make sure players know what movement they have available to them on their turn. All right, so any questions on as far as what you're looking at? Also, there are some passenger tokens and the actual flag tokens out here as well, but that pretty much covers everything that you're looking at out there on the main board. Over here in the player tableaus, however, we have a player clipboard or their player board right there. These are asymmetric player boards in a sense that these uh, bonus spaces are going to be randomly put out here, or they're going to be different on each of our player boards, I should say. There's also a space up here for company money and as well as two unbuilt company ships that players may build for their company. Then there are four shares of the company stock available for all the players to purchase. And then there are rows of country flag spaces for completing contracts for that company. The, and again, there are special immediate rule breakers or bonuses when placing the country's flags on these areas. Then there are spaces for cruise ship passengers for permanent rule breakers for that player, which we'll explain later. Then off of the actual clipboard, we have what is essentially the player area. You have a starting contract that every player is going to have, something along the lines of like so. But in addition to that, and we'll sort that out before we get started, everybody has their starting money. It has one share of their company and their starting uh, two-slot uh, two ship available to be placed out on the board, and last but not least, a financial advisor. And these financial advisors are going to be some sort of in-game scoring card that are going to be secret for all the players. And obviously we're gonna shuffle this one up before we all get started. So that's what we're looking at. Now, we are playing with the advanced setup, which means that we're going to be choosing varying amounts of money between ourselves and our companies. That's why the companies don't have any money at this moment, but they will before we start, and why each player is going to start with $24, okay? More on that when we actually get started. So that's everything component-wise which you guys are looking at. Let's go ahead and talk about how the game is played. The game is played over three rounds, which those... Uh, markers up there will designate which round we are in, where in turn or rail order or train order up there, players are going to take turns selecting a die from the action table and taking the associated action until they've taken four actions each. There are 16 dice up here, there are four players, ergo four turns apiece per round. Their options when they select a die from the action table are to move ships through the canal via locks and waterway movement, or to load cargo, or possibly and or possibly take contracts. The game ends at the end of the third round and after final scoring, whoever ran the best shipping company shown by having the most money is the winner. Now each round follows the same, call it three steps. Step one is selecting a die from the action table, and then the second step is carrying out the movement or loading cargo 
or mo moving ships or loading cargo. In the, we're going to do this four times per player in turn order. And then step three, once everyone is done, all the dice are gone from here, we're going to do the end of round stuff, which has a little bit of maintenance as well as upkeep costs, so on and so forth. So we're going to dive right into phases one and two, which is choosing a die from the action table and then carrying out the action. So there are two sides to the action table. You have a blue side here and you have a gray side here. The left side is regarding moving ships. The right side is for loading cargo and possibly selecting contracts. So we're going to talk about the right side of that action table first, meaning from the four dice up through the six dice, including those contracts as you see them there. So the first thing we should do is talk about contract cards. So I'm going to go ahead and come over here and we're going to talk about this contract card. The contract cards are double sided. On one side, they have a country flag. On the other side, they have a generic, which is a non-country side. As you can see, it shows the pip value of the dice on it, but no country flag. Whereas the main side has a country flag and uh, how many numbers show how many dice or cargo each contract holds and their pip value. So whenever I say cargo or anytime I say dice, it's referring to the player dice and the cargo. So this contract initially would come with a four value die and a three value die on it like so. Okay. You must have available day dice from either the warehouse down here or the dice pool to be able to select a contract card when you take an action die from the board up here, okay? Cargo is going to get loaded uh, from contracts onto the ships in associated loading zones, i.e. the country flags, regardless of the country, okay? So talking about these, these contract cards, you're gonna also notice that there is a rail symbol on one side or the other. You'll notice here that this contract card does not show a rail symbol. So what does that tell you? That tells you that there's going to be a three value cargo on the other side that is also a rail symbol right there, as you know, or as you can see, okay? Anytime it has one or two cargo containers on it, that means there's going to be one cargo container on the other side. Anytime there are three cargo container, I'm sorry, three on this, there will be two on this side. And if there's not a rail symbol, there will be one on this side. If there's not on this side, you know it'll be on this side, okay? All right, so cargo gets loaded from contracts, as I said, on the ships in associated loading zones, so the country flag, okay? So in other words, this US West Area, uh, uh, contract here can only load ships here in the U.S. West loading zone. If there are any ships out here in a given waiting zone like so, those can also be moved into to then load dice onto those contracts or from those contracts. So dice will come from these contracts onto the associated area. Whereas anytime you see a rail symbol like so, it is actually going to go into the first car over there on the leftmost space, but we'll talk about that more in a little bit, okay? Any questions there on the contract cards as far as the being able, having the dice on them and how they're going to load? I'll go into the details of the actual loading here momentarily, no. okay? Nope. Nope. All right, so when selecting a die, from the action table. So going back to this example here. When selecting from here, you must take the bottom of a column. This shows how many loading actions the player may take on their turn. So the bottom column here would allow a player to do one load action, whereas the bottom die here would allow them to take three loading actions. And over here, as luck would have it, would be two loading actions. If there were no dice available, they cannot select that. There is a way to adjust that, but we'll talk about that more here in a little bit. All right, so if I choose this die, we're just going to basically discard this die off to the side to show that I've ta taken it. I may take three loading actions 
from any contracts that I have in front of me. In addition, I may select the associated contract there on the space. Notice the little outline here. These dice correspond to this contract, so on and so forth as we go, okay? All right. A player is allowed to have a maximum of two unfulfilled contracts at the end of their turn. What that means is you may temporarily have more than two unfulfilled contracts as long as you only have two unfulfilled at the end of their turn, okay? That's, it's a subtlety in the rules, but that's an important thing to point out. Then, after we have taken the dice from the warehouse, and if there's no dice in the warehouse from the dice pool, we will then immediately refill from the incoming card out here onto this space, then we will then refill, so it's a little conveyor. Notice this one did not move. These, wherever they are, are locked once they're here, then we just fill from this space into the associated space and then move over from there, okay? All right, the actual act of loading cargo works as such. First off, there are three different types of ships. There are regular ships, which are player-owned cargo ships. Then there are cruise ships, and you'll know they're cruise ships because cruise ships accept die value or pip values of one and two only. So cargo ship, or I'm sorry, cruise ship, cruise ship, and there's one more over here. Then there are military ships. You'll notice that they have red X's on them. They do not accept any cargo. They are simply cash generators for the players, okay? You may only load one die per ship in a single action. I'm stressing the term single action because there are ways to be able to load multiple dice onto the same ship, but they must be in different actions. I'll go into detail on that in a little bit. The flag and the pip value is going to dictate where it can go or possibly the train symbol, okay? So let's go ahead and talk about the train symbol one first. So the train symbol here says it should have a three value die. So regardless of what value they were in your warehouse or in the dice pool, um, the, you place them on here with those die values. So placing this onto a train here, what that would be is the yellow die would then go up to the leftmost space on the first train car. That's going to have to do with turn order, which we will now only revisit essentially at the end of the round, okay? So that was loading onto the train, easy enough. Then, loading onto a ship. Well, this is a US West card, and it is a four value cargo. So what does that mean? Well, we look in US West. US West has the dice fest line, which these only accept one and two pit value dice. Well, my four value cannot go onto that. It cannot go into or onto a military ship. What it can do, however, is go onto one of the regular ships or possibly the San Juan Prospector if it were in the US West. Well, these are available in the waiting area. Anybody can choose. So I could choose my ship or I could choose Andrew's ship. Maybe I choose Andrew's ship here. You'll notice that it is a two slot ship because there are two slots for dice um, or cargo to go on. It shows a minimum value of five, a maximum value of 11. So if I place this four on there, we have not met the threshold for that to go sailing. It must have a minimum value of five, meaning somebody else must load something onto the ship, at least one pip value, so that up to a total of, well, 10, because six is the highest that it can go, all right? Whereas if this were actually a six value pip, or five value, it could actually go sailing. Anybody could make that go sailing as we go. But that is the actual mechanism of loading ships, like so. Again, remember that three die, may I? Mm -hmm. Indulge me, and let's say this weren't a train symbol on it. It were just a regular four and three. What I cannot do is I cannot load both of those because that is two ships or two dice on the same ship in the same action. I cannot, but what I could do if that weren't a train symbol is I could do something along the lines of like so. Does that make sense? Is that clear for loading ships? Yep. Okay. One more question though. If uh -huh. for some reason someone had a one pip on there. The minimum value be? on that ship would have to be a four because it only has two slots and that must 
meet the minimum threshold to be able to go sailing in that case. So you have to place at least a four pip Correct. die. Correct. So uh, on a subsequent turn, whether it's me or someone else, I could not do that because that's fu a full ship, yet it hasn't met its minimum threshold. Does that make sense? Yes. All right, cool. So putting this back here, there we go. All right. Now, also, players, as an additional bonus action on their turn, they may purchase or build, if you would like to say, either or both of the ships on their player tableau at any time. They For $5 from the company money, so let's say the company had $10, I could pay $5 to then immediately place this out into any available loading area. Not a waiting area, but a loading area. So, for instance... Getting back to our example that that wasn't a train symbol and that ship was not available. Well, I want to be able to load, so maybe I pay five bucks to the bank and then this ship comes out. I place it into this loading area and then I place that three value die and it's a two to five. Well, hey, look at that. That can automatically go sailing. Awesome. Okay, but I had to pay that money from the company coffers. Or... I could have chosen my three slot ship if I wish to, but that would have cost seven, or I could have done both if I had $12 to be able to spend from the company coffers. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, cool. So let's go ahead and put that back up there. All right. And let's say I went ahead and I loaded this, putting this back out here, there, and there we go. Now. When a contract is empty of all the, all the cargo or dice, the player gets a matching flag from the supply and places it in the leftmost column on their player board and immediately takes the bonus shown, if any, then you discard the contract. Okay, what does that mean? Well, this is a U.S. West. All the dice are empty from there. So we take a U.S. West flag here, then we place it onto the U.S. West in the leftmost slot. Well, you'll notice I'm not covering anything, any bonus, so okay, no harm, no foul. However, let's go ahead, now's a good time to go ahead and talk about these actions real quick. If, however, it were a generic contract, you notice there's no flag. What does that mean? You don't get a flag. However, the benefit of a generic contract is this die can be loaded on any ship. Obviously, you have to follow the rules. This is a three pip cargo, meaning it can't go onto a cruise ship, but it could go on any ship in any loading zone. So you get to complete the contract, which means you get cargo moved out of your warehouse. However, you don't get the flag. Okay. But once I've gotten the flag, I then discard this contract back out of the game. Okay. Easy enough. So let's go ahead and go over what the bonus actions are are here. First one is anytime you see the stock market action, this is the most confusing, but it's actually very simple. You may purchase one share of any company at current value. You pay the money to the company and you move that company's value up one step. What does that mean? Well, everyone is currently at $6. Maybe I see Martin is doing really well. Indulge me. Let's say it were happening. I understand. It's possible. It's possible. <laughs> so I would then pay $6 from my personal money to Martin's company. He, The company takes the money. I get one share from Martin. That goes into my personal supply. This will be worth hopefully more money than I paid for it at the end of the game. And Martin's value of his company moves up one step. Easy enough, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. All right. However... You are allowed to defer this action. So let's say instead of it being a U.S. West contract, it were an EU contract. If it were an EU contract there, let's say, you know what? I don't have the money. Maybe I only had five bucks and I can't afford it. Or for whatever reason, I want to hold on to my money for something else. Well, if that's the case, you can flip over that, that uh, flag and it shows a deferred action. All right. What that means is if you do defer, you're going to flip that over, and the next time I get an EU flag specifically, then I must take that action immediately. Or if I don't, okay, no harm, no foul, I just lost the ability to take that stock market action to buy that share. It doesn't matter if I got an U.S. East, a China, or a U.S. West flag. It's only when I got another EU that I would have to make that decision right then. 
then I could buy that share. And then if you notice, if I got a second EU flag, well, what happened? <coughs> Bless you. We then go into what's the next option? Well, if I cover this one, load one die from a contract, a w the warehouse, or a dice pool at value two. And since this is a separate action, you can load a ship that you already loaded this turn. And that's one of the ways you can do so. That's kind of crafty if you can chain those actions together. All right. Now, then you'll notice that this action right here is just like this, but it shows a rail action. So what does that mean? You may take a two value die and load it onto the rail table if there's space, but it must come from a warehouse or the dice pool. So for instance, if this had a die on it right here at a two value, it doesn't show the train. I, I can't do that for here. It must specifically come from here if there are dice available. If there are no dice available, then it must come from here and it immediately goes up to the rail up there. So in that case, maybe that would then go up and I can have multiple dice up there, which is kind of nice. But maybe all of those slots were full. Well, if that's the case, the other option here is you can add a two pip to an existing die up there. Martin, if you would change that for me. So moving that from a three to a five. And the reason I'm going to want to do that will become apparent at the end of the round. Okay. So place a die up on the rail from the warehouse or uh, from the dice pool or bump an existing one of yours two pips. The last action is must make three movement of ships of your choice uh, through locks or through waterways. I haven't talked about movement, but you must do this. However, all of these actions are voluntary. You do not have to do that. If you choose to do this action, you're moving three total. You must, if at all possible. Okay. All right. I should also point out that a player may choose to take a die from one from any of these on this side and effectively pass and do nothing. Choose not to load anything and choose not to take a contract. Only on this side are you allowed to do that. That is loading contra or loading ships and taking contracts. Is there any question left on those? Nope. No. No. All right. Cool. Then let's go ahead and move on to well, moving ships. Selecting a die from the left-hand side of the action table, the blue table, means a player must move their choice of ships on the board, okay? You must make all movement if possible, even if you don't want to, tough kitty said to kitty when the milk ran dry, you must do so, all right? So there are two types of movement. There are locks and there are waterway movements. The symbols match what type of movement. So you'll notice that the first column on the left has one lock movement, the middle has two lock movement, the right side has three lock movement. So depending on which die you take, you're going to get that many lock movements that you must take. And if, say, I choose this die, we're gonna move the lock movement marker to two, and then where I take this die from shows how many waterway movements. So in this case, I would get two and two. So we'll discard that die, okay? You must take the bottom die in a column, obviously. And now, elig eligible ships that are allowed, or these ships that are eligible to be moved, what are they? All ships somewhere out here on the canal, easy enough, okay? So those are eligible to be moved. All military ships, meaning they have the red X's that don't take cargo, are eligible to move anywhere on the board, and all ships in a loading zone that have the minimum cargo on board. So I already covered that, so I don't really need to address that. However, I do want to bring your attention to the cruise ships. The cruise ships have two different colors. They have black markings and they have white markings on them. Before cruise ships are allowed to set sail, all of the black colored areas must be covered by dice, either one or two pip value, respectively. The third one, in this case, in this case, the second one in this case, is optional, and it may or may not be filled, but it cannot shit sail until both of those spaces or all the black colored spaces are filled, okay? All right, now let's 
talk about the board in moving ships. The board is divided into zones. Lakes are unlimited with the number of ships that they can hold. So we can have a huge log jam or ship jam of ships out here in the two lakes out here, as well as the loading and waiting zones respectively. Locks, however, you'll notice have a space for a total of four cargo spots or proverbial cargo spots. So you'll notice, for instance, if this, if I were to set sail there and something along that, there's a space for four right there. Okay. When moving ships, they may be grouped in any mix up to the four slots total as a single movement. Now, let's say, for instance, this ship was already existing here as part of the movement, and let's say this were a five so that that can set sail, can move this for one waterway movement, I then can add this and that will group up with any existing ships if it can fit within the size of one lock, okay? A group of ships, however, must stay together through the series of locks until they reach a lake. Once they reach a lake, they can be separated and grouped differently or separate or however you wanna do it. So once you go through, when you enter a series of locks, they're now locked together, <laughs> okay? If you wanna move ships into a lock that has a ship or ships already in it, and there's no room for the ship the player is wanting or th there's no room for the ship that the player is wanting to move so let's say i want to move this military ship into this area then it's going to push the ship or group of ships in front of it into the next space whether it be a lock or a lake this may cause a chain reaction so you'll notice that when I move that ship, I will have expended one waterway movement. So my waterway movement would have gone down one. Then, as an example, if I wanted to take this military ship and move it into here, there is not room because only one slot would fit in there. So for the cost of one more waterway movement, I then can push this into, which then pushes the entire existing group into the next lock, but I did not have to expend the lock movement because I just pushed the ship using that movement, okay? Now, the push ships, meaning these guys here, do not convey any bonuses, but if and when they reach the end of a canal, making their way all the way through out to here, they will then provide the players whose ships they are and any cargo on them the rewards that they earned. However, you'll notice that I pushed it with this military ship. I would not convey any bonus for this ship, for this military ship, because that was the pushed ship, whereas this is the one that actually triggered the movement. Does that make sense? Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Now, you might be asking yourself, well, if they don't take cargo, why should I bother moving military ships? Well, I moved that Chinese ship here, and let's say I had something along alliance here. When you move a military ship, the player receives money from the bank based on the number of flags of that country that they have on the player clipboard. So if I move that Chinese ship, I will have gotten $2 to the player, meaning to my personal money, not to my company. Because basically what they're saying is my shipping company, me as the owner, I've done that country a solid by completing a couple of contracts in theory. So they're they're willing to, you know, give me a little bit to help them for moving their military ships, okay? Regardless of the number of spaces or the number of military ships moved in a single action, the player only gets paid once. So you'll notice, let's say I had also a US West flag. So I moved the two waterway movement. Well, maybe, maybe I choose to then okay, this has done its job, I'm gonna leave that there. I'm gonna spend one of my lock movement to then move this out. I could have spent one lock movement to push this along, but for whatever reason, maybe I didn't wanna do that. So now that these are in a lake, these are now ungrouped and I can do whatever I want with them. But I did move on the same turn, a US West ship. Well, if I have this US West marker on here, you would think I would get paid a buck. I would not. Why? Because I already, in a single action, meaning a single action being all of that movement up there, I already got paid. 
for the Chinese ship, I don't get paid for both. Okay, and obviously I would take the higher value in that case. Does that make sense? Is that clear regarding mm -hmm. military ship? Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. All right. If there is ever an empty column of dice, let's say for whatever reason, it's something like this. And I want to take this contract card and I want to be able to do this action. The player may pay $5 from the company money, the company money being right here. I can pay company money to take any of the bottom column or bottom die from any column. Let's say maybe I choose this yeah, maybe I, uh, no, no, this one value die, I then can freely move it over to either here, changing it to a six, here, changing it to a five. Well, I can't do it to a four since there's already ones there. And this would go to the highest, most space, and then I can take that action, okay? But that cost $5 as shown right here. What I can do that in either direction as long as they're an empty column. What I cannot do, however, is I cannot take, say, this four, which is already in this gray area, and then pay the five bucks and turn it into a five. Sorry, if it's in the same half, it must switch halves. It must switch actions that it's going to be doing. Is that clear? Yep. All right. Before we go into the ships making their destination, i.e. the other end of the canal, is there any questions on movement? So if we were to move this there, that would cost one waterway movement. If we wanted to move it all the way down, we would have to expend three cargo movement to make that to the end there, okay? And in this case, I still have one lock movement that I must do before it my, I end my turn. So what are my options here? Well, looking here, I could move this Chinese ship there, but I've already gotten paid for it. So eh, whatever on that. I could move this ship through this lock into here, or pretty much that's it. Those are my only options. So you know what? As my other action, I'll go ahead and move that there. Boom, done. That's movement. So now let's go ahead and talk about if ships make it to their destination. All right. Ships completing their trip through the canal. The order in which these ships make it out matters. So indulge me. Let's say it were something along the lines of there, there, and uh, let's go ahead and say this were there. I think that works. All right. So on someone's turn, they have a couple of lock movement and they say, you know what, they're going to push this out, so that's one lock movement to do so, and these are now free out here. The order in which the ships exit the canal is the order in which the ships resolve, okay? So if it's a player-owned ship, which you know this one is because it's a black border on the top, each company receives $1 per dice, per pip on the dice for the delivering ship. So what does that mean? Black, because it is a four pip die, a black four pip die, they would get $4 to their company, okay? Then the owner of the ship, depending on the number of pips, they can choose to either get cash or cards depending on the size of the ship. The size of the ship was a one pip size. So in that case, a one pip size ship means they can take a captain card or $2 cash. The captain cards on them have bonus movement, as you can see here. At any time on that player's turn, they may use this, and that's five lock or waterway movement. You must move all five, but it's any mix that you choose to do so. So that's the benefit of having the actual being the owner of the ship, okay? A two-slot ship would then allow you to take a stevedore card or $3 for the player. So what are stevedore cards? Well, they allow the loading, just like the special action that's here on your player board, it's the same symbol, and or, or I should say or, you can save this card and pay less cargo fees. There are two types in this game. There are pay half your cargo fee or pay $3 less 
of your cargo fee. This one happens to be a half, okay? Now, one thing I should point out is a player is only allowed to have a single stevedore card and a single captain card at any given time. So if I delivered, if it was a two, notice this two ship here will shortly go out. If red, if Andrew already had a stevedore card, he would have to take the $3. He cannot choose to take a captain card because it's like, no, two slot ship is a stevedore card or $3 cash to his pocket. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Last is a three uh, slot ship, which in that case, this is the only ones available. You have to build them first and they cost $7 from the company money in which to build. But these get you financial advisor cards. What happens is you can look through the entire stack and choose one. These are end game cards. You're allowed to cash in two of those at the end of the game, but you may have multiple to give yourself options, but you're only going to cash in two at the end of the game or take five bucks. So that's what happened when this ship delivered. It then goes up into the waiting area and anybody can load that ship in either of those two zones. However, if it were a cruise ship, each die on the ship earns that player one passenger token in turn order. So in this case, if Andrew's the one who moved it, maybe he did because he pushed with this ship, or maybe I did, he, in turn order, regardless of the pip value, he would get to choose the top passenger. Those are in descending value from five to one. But let's say I'm the one that pushed it. I would take this five value passenger, okay, and I can place it on any of the three passenger spaces on my player board, which are going to convey permanent bonuses for the player. So what are they? Instead of it costing $5 to transfer dice in between areas, it now costs $2 instead. That's kind of nice. The next slot, or if I chose this one instead, when picking a contract, I can select from the normal space. So if I chose a die from here, I choose here or either of those two locations out there on the board, which is really nice, the flexibility. And this last one is whenever I choose an action on the right side of the table, if I'm loading a ship, I can load one additional cargo. So if I took it and I took this die that normally only allows two loads, well, if I have this, I now get three loading from a contract or mix of contracts, okay? In addition to that, the player this company is also going to make whatever the cash is based on the number on the passenger. So this one being a five, if it were a one, I would only get one buck to the company, okay? All right. I already kind of explained what happens here. In this case, I would, if this delivers, my company would get $5 because it's a yellow die. However, the owner of the ship being a two slot ship would, so in this case, Andrew would get either a stevedore card if he doesn't have one or $3, his choice. The last of the special ships that I wanna talk about is the San Juan Prospector. The San Juan Prospector, you'll notice, has nine to 18 here as far as uh, slots, okay? So it cannot go sailing until there are at least nine pips total, meaning at least two dice in theory on here. The benefit of this ship being delivered is everybody who has a die on that ship, the owner of the dice on board may choose one of their dice to receive double the income. So if it's a five, if they have a five and a two, or let's say a six and a two on this, I can double the income so of one die. So I get 12 bucks for this and I get three bucks for that to my company. Nice, it's a good way to boost your company coffers. All right, if However, it's a military ship. This is pretty exciting. If this military ship makes it all the way, it just goes there. The end, done. All right. Any questions on delivering ships? No. Nope. All right. The last thing we need to talk about before we get to the end of the round are executive dice. Mm -hmm. If you move a die over and there's no dice in that slot, this white die becomes an executive die. It moves all the way to the top. Or if that's not the case, just for to clear it out for to show on the camera, we have the blue dice up here. Executive dice work very similar depending on where they are, except you'll notice that there are options. Each of these executive dice, you have a total of three options on what to do with them. You could choose, if 
for instance, I chose this two die here, I'm going to, if I choose movement, just like the regular white dice, I would get two lock movement and I would get three waterway movement. That's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. If it were on this side, I would then be able to take this contract. If I took that five die, obviously that would have to be gone. If I took that, I may take that contract and I would get three loadings. Okay, those are pretty standard. However, the other options are the same on both sides. You may either buy one share of any company stock, as long as it's available using your own personal money. And if you do, you would then boost the value of that company that you bought by one slot, just like what you did with the special actions on these. Or instead of that, you may boost the value of your company by two spots. So maybe, okay, Whoop. which is awesome because it's going to pay out that at the end of the game. However, that means higher dividends, which can be a mixed bag, but that's executive dice. Pretty simple. Any questions on executive dice? No. Nope. 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 All right, let's talk about what happens after all the dice are taken, all 16 dice are taken. Well, then we go into the end of the round. So after all players have taken four actions, we start off with the rail table. And let's say for argument's sake, there, let's say those are the results up there. That seems thematic because Martin doesn't like having any dice up there. Anyway, so the first thing that's going to happen, those are going to move over to the first, second car. Then, whoever, we're, this is where they're going to change turn order. Highest pip value total between the dice. Yellow has nine, red has six, green has three, black has nothing. So that would be the new turn order as you see it like so. After that is done, those are going to move over one more step and Based on the pit value, everybody that has dice up there is going to choose one bonus flag to then place onto their player board. And in this case, maybe I look at that and I say, you know what, let me go ahead and have an EU flag, please. Now notice I have two dice up there. That does not mean I get to choose two flags. That just means I have a higher pit value. But here's the cool thing. As soon as I do this, I immediately get that bonus. So I can immediately load a two value from a contract if I have any contracts or straight from the pool up here which might save me some money when we get to upkeep okay then enter in that order so red would get to choose one of the available ones then green and black I'm so sorry you don't get one all right then after that we're going to pay cargo fees so I did briefly mention that you'd have to pay for your cargo not already delivered right so here we go. As shown on the board spaces, any of these purple spaces out here, wherever you have cargo, let's say this did not deliver. So out here, obviously there's going to be a whole lot more dice out on the board, but anywhere out here on the board, on contracts, notice there are costs on the contracts, as well as the big daddy space, which is here in the warehouse, which is really unfortunate. You add up all of your dice. So in this case, yellow would owe $2 for that one die, another dollar for that, and $5 from that. That would be $8 from the company coffers. Whereas poor Martin, we're picking on him today, this here would have, he would owe a total of $20 from the company coffers. I should also mention that when these dice deliver, these dice come back into the dice pool over there. So he would owe $20. Well, what happens if he can't pay? Well, now Martin owes from his pocket to make up the difference. Well, what happens if Martin doesn't have that kind of cheese, that kind of cheddar? Oh, we have loans, don't worry. In that case, he would take $10 from the bank into his personal pocket to then pay whatever fees, and he gets to keep in his personal pocket whatever the difference is. His company will, will end up with zero money in it. However, at the end of the game, he's gonna owe 15 bucks, 50% interest at the end of the game, no matter what. No way to pay these off early. Sorry, plan better, okay? If you have to take multiple loans, well, really plan better in that case. All right, so that's, we're all gonna pay our cargo fees. Then, in theory, we're gonna pay dividends. So. Yellow's company would pay $4 per share to all the shareholders that have stock. Well, as it were, only one share of yellow has been paid. So as long as there is $4 in the company money, I'm going to pay, well, I pay $4 to myself. Well, cool. All right. Easy enough. Good deal. Woo. Oh, Martin, he owed 
He owes, right? He pays div. Oh wait, he couldn't pay his cargo fees. He doesn't pay dividends, which sucks for all the shareholders, including himself. But what really hurts is he didn't pay. The stockholders are upset, so that drops to value. Womp womp. And each company is going to must pay dividends if it's able. That's paying dividends. But then we move on to the manager director. Those are bonus points at the end of the game, three, five, and seven, respectively. Each company that paid dividends, whatever's the highest share value gets that. So in this case, I paid dividends. I'm the highest share value. I get that. That's going to be worth three points at the end of the game. Awesome. Good deal. If there were two companies tied and they both paid share or they paid dividends, whichever company has the highest leftover in their company coffers after paying dividends gets it. And if still tied, uh, who, who's ever in turn order? New turn order. So after that, we're going to replace any flags over here. So an EU flag would go up there. We would replace all of those up on the rail table. We're going to move all the dice from the dice pool over to here, which all of a sudden, Martin now has nine dice to get out of here by the end of the round. Godspeed. <laughs> all right. Then after that, we're going to take all 16 dice that are out here for the rail table. We're going to roll them and put them out here. You must have at least four dice, a minimum, on each side. If not, roll all the dice again. That's called the mulligan rule. If there are more dice than what is available. So let's say we rolled all those fours and maybe there's one more four. Well, what happens? They cascade downward. So in that case, a four becomes a three. It actually changes its pip value, becomes there. If there were another three, that would cascade down to a two, so on and so forth, until we get to ones. If there's too many ones, we cascade it back up the other way. Last thing to go over, in-game scoring. So at the end of the third round, players tally up their final score. Cash on hand. They cash out all their shares at current share value there. They're going to complete any up to two financial advisor cards that they want. Then any managing director tokens, those little end of round tokens, three, five, and seven points. And if you're Martin, you're going to pay off any loans that you may have gotten. Whoever has the most money wins. If tied, final turn order decides it. Notice what I didn't talk about. Any money in the company coffers left over, it was merely a tool. It does not count for endgame scoring. And that, folks, <gasps> is how you play Panamax.